Okay, so yeah, we want to get we want to get started here today for the seminar. So, um, so we big honor here to have Dr. Norman Grody present some work um, on microwave remote sensing. Norm uh, worked at NOAA for for over 30 years, retired in 2005, um, and anything I know about microwave, I learned from this man here. He's he's a he's a was a pioneer in the field. Helped design many instruments at NOAA. For those who are familiar, I think was the the AMSU data, AMSU sensor. Uh, Norm did numerous studies. That he's the first to see warm core anomalies in hurricanes with the, with the MSU sensor, uh, and really anything to do with the surface and the atmosphere with microwaves, which were traditionally just done for temperature soundings, was the work that Norm did. So it's a real honor. Uh, he's still very active, doing things, building things, and so he wants to he wants to share with you some of his uh, knowledge about about microwave remote sensing, and then then he may may play around with his instrument as well for anybody who wants to see anything about it. So, and Norm, a lot of the people in the audience are calibration specialists and microwave remote sensing people at NOAA, kind of the new generation of scientists um, as well. So, um, and. So we're going to turn it over to you. Okay. Well, that's good. Um, my the radiometer I'm showing here is one I built. Now uh, it's funny. It 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 turned out that it it took me quite a while, and I'll explain some of it. I have actually two parts to this. I'm only going to be discussing part one, which is the um, things you're probably more familiar with, which is satellite radiometers. But actually, I have also built home base radiometers at 4, 12, and 20.5 gigahertz. That's 20.5 gigahertz. I'm not going to really spend a lot of time discussing that, but I will talk more about something you're probably more interested in, which is the satellite work limit. I just, I just messed up here. OK. Now, uh, let me just give you a background. Um, I know I was not familiar with this so much when I started. By the way, my background originally is electrical engineering. Then I did some work in physics. But I never really knew about radiometers until I got my first job. I worked at NASA for one year. And I finally realized what a radiometer is. But uh, <clears throat> what, what, you, what, you really, what you have to realize is the radiometers um, really began in the 1930s. And the uh, people, Jansky and Reber, okay, whoops, let me go back. Hold it. Okay. They, uh, they were the original radio astronomers. Um, and um, their, their work is the thing that preceded all of the microwave work. That was done in 1930, around that period. It was only until about 1943-44 that uh, Bob Dickey developed a microwave radio. It was all a result of work that was done during World War II involving radar. And this receiver that he built, he built a few of them, was really only used to measure the, op the absorption uh, in the atmosphere. Uh, it was an, an experimental device. and. Um, People, his particular unit worked in the microwave region up to about 20 gigahertz. Uh, following his work, NASA decided they're going to go ahead and do, originally it was so, looking at the solar system and then it was looking at Earth, but in the beginning in 1962, people at MIT built a, a, a radiometer to look at the planet Venus, and that was done in 62 right here. Uh, following that, in 1968, the Russians started launching their first microwave radiometer. This is before we started launching them to look at Earth, not, not to look at the solar system. And uh, I know I spent a lot of time looking at the Russian literature because they were really the forerunners in some of this work, that, as far as I know. Following that, NASA started in 1971 with what microwave radiometers. Um, and I happened to be fortunate that I started working at NASA and then NOAA at the time when they first started building these instruments. So you're at the very beginning of a new science, and it's 
really wonderful because everything is brand new. You're making all kinds of discoveries. Uh, in 2005, when I retired, I got the idea of maybe trying to build an instrument. And through the internet, I was able to find out a lot of information on how to build homemade radiometers. And so that's really what I'm, wh why I, where I end right here. There's a three instruments here that I built. One is at 4 gigahertz, one is at 12, and one is at 20.5. And those particular frequencies are the only ones I could build because the equipment that I could buy, I could purchase, happened to be right working at those bands. Um, to build anything at any other frequency would be a lot more difficult. Okay, let's see. So the next... Ah, this is the book I, I had. Well, it's a book. It really is a book. I, I call it a report. I, didn't, I just put it on the internet and you can look at it. This describes all, all the things I learned about microwave instruments and radiometry, calibrating them and uh, building them. And uh, I've made a lot of discoveries from working with these instruments. And it's all, it's all outlined here. And uh, you're welcome to go ahead and use it and look at it if you're interested. Now, let's see here. OK. now. The first instrument that I ever built, and it's one that's actually the one that people use today in space, is called a total power radiometer. I don't, there are two kinds of radiometers. They're called total power and Dickey radiometers. I'll explain the difference. The total power radiometer is the simplest. OK, what does it have? You have the antenna, which is a reflector and a feed horn, which captures the radiation from a target, as well as the Earth and cold space. If you're doing linear calibration, that's all you need. You go into what they call an isolator. And the isolator happens to be an important device, which I discovered. What the isolator does is it makes sure that anything that this antenna sees is only coming from this direction, not the opposite. It's called an isolator. It only picks up radiation into the receiver that comes in this direction. Anything coming from the receiver in this direction doesn't, get, doesn't come out. What, why that's important, I'll explain later. But the main thing is you have an isolator. Then you have this little box here, which does all the work. It contains three components, an, an oscillator called a local oscillator, a mixer that takes the radiation that you see and translates it to a lower frequency. <clears throat> By going to a lower frequency through a mixer, you can now use lower frequency amplifiers. This is, con this is called uh, heterodyne. It's very common in any receiver. And um, these devices are really very cheap. They're actually made in China. And they cost from anywhere from 10 to $50. The one in, in this unit is a $50 unit. And this does all the work. Then if you come out of this device here, you go into a detector, which takes this signal that's been down converted. And it produces an output proportional to the power. It's called a square law device. This is a very important unit. In fact, all of the problems you have with radiometers as far as calibration, linearity, are all derived because of this device. There's no such thing as a perfect square law device. There's no such thing as a perfect power law detector. It only works over a certain range of input signal strength. And so you have to make sure you bias it in that region. Anyway, coming out of that, you go into an, another amplifier. And this is the calibration that you're familiar with. It's a linear calibration. It just uses the, the cold space and the, uh, the warm target to provide an intercept and a slope. And that's derived from this equation. Now, uh, the problem with a total power radiometer, which I'll show you, is when you go ahead and look at the, um, well, this, this actually is the NE delta T that you would get from a total power radiometer. You'll notice it has two terms. The first term is the term which is the, called the integrator part. That's the one that people talk about when they say, 
okay, uh, what what is the how, how long are you gonna are you gonna um, monitor your signal? What's the time that you're gonna actually monitor the signal? And the and the integration time is indicated here. Now, the longer you monitor, the smaller this component, which is the, which is a noise source. But the second component has to do with fluctuations in the gain of all of these electronic components. And that turns out to be a very important parameter. And the only way to get rid of this, if you're using a total power, is to make sure you calibrate very frequently. Frequently enough so that these gain variations can be reduced through the integration. Um, I mentioned, you can see that the, uh, the, the change in output, which is voltage with respect to temperature, does depend on the, um, the, the linearity and the temperature dependence of the detector and the gain, okay? So let me go to the second, the second slide here. Okay, now there's that device I told you about, which is this unit that does all the work which has in it a, an amplifier, a mixer, a local oscillator, and a final stage low noise amplifier. These are, they make them at three different frequency bands. Of course, you can build them at others, but the ones that are commercially produced work at what they call C band, KU band, and KA band. So if you want to work around four gigahertz, you use this device. If you want to work around 12 gigahertz, you use this device. And this is the one that works at 20.5, which is in this unit right here. So this is the key component, and it's called an LND, meaning low noise block uh, amplifier or detector or whatever. But that's, that's the key component here. Now, here was my first radiometer that I built. It's very simple. Okay, here is the device, the low noise block device. And in this box here is the, uh, the amplifiers, the integrator, and the DC amplifier, which I constructed. And uh, right now it's looking up at, this is a 12 gigahertz unit. It's looking up in the sky, and it's measuring a half a volt, okay? And if you go ahead and turn around and look at a very warm target, it'll go up to 10 and a half volts, okay? So the sensitivity of this device is 30 millivolts per degree Kelvin. And this device was very simple to make. Only problem is, I'll show you next, the, um, here it is. I simply packaged it a little differently. It's, it, there is, there's the device itself. I built an antenna or a horn, and this is the, uh, the amplifiers. This reflector is what's reflecting the sky radiation into the device itself, the radiometer. And I simulated rain very simply by using a sprinkler. I, I didn't really know what I was going to find, but it worked very well. Let me show it to you. This sprinkler goes back and forth, back and forth. Lots of rain, right? Okay, now we go to the next one. And this is what I found. This is no fudging. This is the signal. Okay, the voltage start, shows these jumps. Now, the, the, this is the sprinkler. When, when it goes in one direction, and then when it comes back in the other direction, you see two pulses. And it keeps going on and on and on and on and on and on. But you notice two things. You do get a nice signal due to the water emission. This is the model right here. Here's your water drops. It, 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 it has an emissivity, one minus the transmittance, which, is the, which depends on the liquid water content from the rain, from the water. And the other is the mean radiating temperature or the temperature of the drops itself. And that's where you get your brightness temperature from, see? But the thing is, while it, and by the way, this is me walking in front of it. That's why you got that big jump. I just happen to walk right behind it. But this thing just keeps jump going up. You wonder what's going on there. Well, you know, at first I, I was kind of surprised. I just thought, well, it's going to stop. It doesn't look like it's stopping. The thing is, it's due to the gain variation, which I mentioned before, with a total power radiometer. In other words, anything, any slight changes in the amplifiers in that device, due to temperature mainly, physical temperature, can cause this thing to just keep jumping. And um, the, what, what you find is, in order to be able to use a device like this effectively, you've got to calibrate this thing like every, less than every minute. 
see if you if you were able to keep calibrating it, you'll be okay. And so here's what I'm saying: to reduce the gain variation, total power radius must be calibrated every minute or less. And um, in, in space, there's no problem because you're constantly looking at the sky or you're looking at a warm target. And so you can build these kind of total power radiometers with no problem, which is what they did since the 1990s. AMSU is a total power radiometer, and the SSMI was a total power radiometer. And the reason they like total power radiometers is they're simpler. The, the noise, the any delta T is a factor of two less. I don't think I explained that, but the, in the equation, it actually turns out because you're constantly looking at your signal, whereas in a, in a Dickey radiometer, you have to keep switching. That's the way the Dickey radiometer works. So you can get a factor of two improvement in noise, the any delta T. But in order to get that, you have to go ahead and calibrate very quickly. Okay, now the next slide shows a Dickey radiometer, okay, which is the ones that, which is this one here, and the ones that really were the original radiometers that were built. And it's very important to use those when you're doing ground-based radio, because you can't calibrate every, less than every minute. You, 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 you want to, so what is a Dickey radiometer? Okay, Dickey radiometer has in it a switch that does a reference. It looks at a reference temperature in this case, it's the temperature inside the switch itself. And it also looks at the scene. And by taking the difference, which is done through this demodulator, this is another component that you have to add to a Dickey radiometer. So when you come out here, you get a difference. It's always a different signal. It's the difference between the reference and what you want to look at, whether it's the Earth, whether it's a target or space. And it actually computes that difference. Those are the voltages as you can see right out coming out of there. And those voltages are proportional to the power level of the signal coming in, mainly because of the square law detector. So here we, here's the equation for a Dickey radiometer. The any delta T, as you see now, the gain variation is reduced because it only depends on the difference between the two signals. And in fact, if those differences made zero, and you can do that actually by using a balanced Dickey radiometer, then there'll be no gain variation. Um, and also, the, uh, but, but the uh, problem is that the, uh, the sensitivity is reduced by a factor of two, and uh, the noise is also, the, is also increased by a factor of two. But that is much more, this is a much better approach for building a radiometer than using a total power, particularly if you're, if you're working, um, you know, in, in uh, doing ground-based radiometry. And uh, here's my, here's the example. This is the Dickey radiometer. It happens to be the 12 gigahertz one. And it's being run for six hours, just looking at space. Uh, that voltage is 4.8 volts, and it only has a deviation of 20 millivolts over, over six hours, which actually results in any delta T of three-tenths of a Kelvin. So this is the instrument that I, I started building, and all of my instruments work this way. And these were the original radiometers that were developed and used um, since World War II when, when Dickey first built his instrument. So that's really all I want to talk about as far as the things I've been playing with. Now I want to talk more about um, satellite work. Now all I'm showing here is the early evolution of the uh, microwave radiometers. Um, I stopped at 2005, which happens to be when I retired. But uh, the point is that many of these instruments, I suppose you may not be that familiar with. I know when I started working, the, the instruments I worked at were the NEMS and the SCAMS. Uh, these were the f forerunners to the AMSU and um, <clears throat> all of the later instruments that are being flown in space for temperature monitoring. As far as, um, as, far as uh, the window channel instruments, which I used to look at the Earth, Actually, ESMERs were the instruments that were, were built for that. I never really got to work much with the ESMA. And then, of course, you're familiar, maybe you're familiar with the other instruments that are listed here. Of course, there's MSU, 
which is based on scams. In other words, I'll show you a picture of it. The scams was the forerunner. It's the first scanning microwave radiometer that was used to measure temperature. And that's the one I really used when I was able to observe the warm core temperature anomalies of hurricanes. That came out of scams. A lot of discoveries came from this instrument. Um, here is the AMSU. And I've highlighted here the ones I think are most important. As I mentioned, the scams, there's the MSU, there's the AMSU, and the SSMI, OK? So um, let me just continue here. As you notice, they're all lower Earth orbiters because of the resolution requirements. Uh, you just can't put those on geostationary. I'll talk a little about that later. <clears throat> Okay, the next thing, next thing I want to do is just mention, maybe some of you are familiar with these things, but this is the unique characteristics of microwave, at least from my point of view. As far as cloud penetration, it's not exactly perfect, but it's, it's good enough. And uh, it's hard to go ahead and beat anything other than the microwave for that. We, and um, that, that's really one of the main things that were found when they first started using microwave. <coughs> When we when we first started looking at the um, the, uh, the, the it was it was the scams that NOAA used as its first experimental instruments, we were kind of amazed to see how well it worked. Um, and the reason that cloud penetration is important, well, you know it's it, it's obviously important when you're going to want to measure severe storms, anything that has a lot of cloud cover. But actually, it turns out. The most important thing is to measure things like winds, ageostrophic winds. There's no way you can determine the ageostrophic winds with an instrument that cannot measure thermal gradients. So by, have, by being independent of clouds, we're able to measure very accurately the thermal gradients and the geostrophic winds for uh, storms. And in fact, um, the MSU was used by the British during the uh, Falkland crisis uh, when there was no available information because of the war effort. And they used that to measure the, the winds directly, atmospheric winds, of course. <clears throat> um, let's see. Um, OK. I have to go. Oh, here yeah, are some of the other things, of course, which are maybe not as important, but they are, they are int interesting to know about. The high spectral resolution, of course, is very easy to get at microwave frequencies because you can measure uh, resolutions to within kilohertz, which we actually do for AMSU's upper sounding channels. And you need, you need to use microwave to get very high spectral resolution. Um, now, as far as the separation between oxygen and water vapor, that's simply because the oxygen is in, in the 60 gigahertz region, and the water vapor starts at 22. So you've got a very large separation between the two of them. As far as the linear temperature response, that's automatic in the, in, because of the Rayleigh genes approximation, <clears throat> which works up to about 300 gigahertz. So the microwave is very good in that, for that. And the next, but the next thing, you, it has its pluses and minuses. It's easy to measure lots of variability due to emissivity in the microwave because of the <clears throat> water molecule, which has a very strong emission characteristic around uh, at, at microwave frequencies. And uh, it's, you, you, in the infrared water, as you know, has an emissivity close to one. The microwave, it can be anywhere as low as 0.5 and lower. So anything that has water in it is very detectable due to emissivity in the microwave. And there's also other surfaces as well, as I'll, I'll point out. OK, so here's are the applications that we're familiar with. <clears throat> Vertical temperature soundings, of course, the important thing that we learn later on is the use for climate. These instruments were never built for climate. But by doing an analysis of the data, you discover that the instruments are very, very accurate and very stable even though they were not originally built for, for climate purposes. Uh, each, each instrument is essentially, that was la is launched in space, is essentially a duplicate of the ones that were done were, were, you know, in the series of polar orbiting satellites. And it's very easy to, to make them almost perfectly the same. 
by the electronic construction of the instruments. So it's very it turns out to be a very good sensor sensor for climate studies, these microwave sensors. And for severe storms, you have to look through clouds, and so microwave is very important for that reason. And these are the things that um, you would measure more or less directly with the microwave. Water vapor, liquid water, rain rate, and now I understand people are working on snowfall. I was never personally involved in that, but now that I, I'm aware of it, I, I added that one as well. And these are the frequencies commonly used for these, for these variables. As far as surface is concerned, uh, surface temperature is hard because of the emissivity problem, but uh, mainly over the ocean, it's not too difficult to, because of the stability of the emissivity over the ocean to measure the sea surface temperature at frequencies of 10 gigahertz and lower. Uh, snow cover and sea ice concentration, uh, ocean wind speed is done at these frequencies, and of course, surface wetness and soil moisture. Um, we have to use sometimes dual polarization in order to be able to dis separate some of the variables. And so I indicated some of the parameters are using both single and dual polarization. And the next thing I'm showing is the two types of instruments, cross track and conical. Cross track is the one you would use if you want to get large swath widths and you weren't worried about the effects of of, of the variations in polarization or the fact that the path length changes as you move out in, to larger angles. Um, and uh, the swath width happens to be the main reason that people want to, want to use cro uh, cross-track scanners for sounders. Whereas in the case of images, the preferred uh, scan geometry is conical scanning because you keep the footprint fixed, you keep the polarization fixed, and of course the slant angle is fixed. So it's a lot easier if you're trying to measure surfaces to go ahead and use this kind of geometry. And um, the next one shows, uh, it just says exactly what I said here, so I can, I can go on. This is the uh, SCAMS instrument, which was the first forerunner to all of the sounders including AMSU. And this was built by JPL for NASA back in 1975. And it contains three separate modules. There's the oxygen band sensor. This is the antenna and the, and the mirror for that. This is the water vapor channel. It's a single frequency at 22.235 gigahertz, which is right at the water vapor line. And the next one is a wind channel. So this is the instrument that really led the way to all of the um, future instruments. Um, now, as far as, as far as looking at the uh, surface, this is the instrument that is probably the best recognized. It's called the SSMI. And this is, was built by Hughes um, in 1987 but for the Navy. And uh, this is an instrument that I was fortunate to be able to work on. And um, we, we did a lot of great studies with this sensor. This, this had channels at 19, 22, 37, and 85 gigahertz. And I'll show you some results from that. Now, I, I guess this is, this is the uh, simple diagram that shows <clears throat> the various microwave components, radiation components, that you would see from a satellite. Here's, your, here's the Earth, here's the atmosphere, and these are the three main components that you get when you go ahead and look down from a satellite. You have the upwelling radiation, you have the downwelling radiation, and then you have the surface emitted radiation. And uh, the reflectivity of the surface is approximated by a specular reflectivity term, one minus the emissivity. So combining all three, this is the final form. And um, the thing about the upwelling and the downwelling radiation is they're approximately the same, at least for window channels, not for sounding channels. And uh, even for sounding channels, it, it turns out you can use this expression, but 
The main point is that it depends on the emissivity of the atmosphere, which is one minus its transmittance, and the mean radiating temperature of the, of the atmosphere, which is given by this equation right here. Okay, combining the three of them, you end up with this final form, which is valid for both window channels and atmospheric channels. And this turns out to be a very convenient form. Uh, <clears throat> all the parameters are combined here. You have the surface emissivity, okay? You have the transmittance and the mean radiating temperature in here. <clears throat> What's very interesting about this is if you plot it, okay? you get a nice parabolic curve. And um, I, I did this uh, assuming a mean temperature of 285 Kelvin and a surface temperature of 305. And these are different parameters of emissivity here. What you notice is, of course, when you're looking over the ocean, you get a very, very dramatic change with a low emissivity so that as the um, as the transmittance, okay, gets less and less due to clouds, water vapor, the, um, the brightness temperature increases. That's, that's what we use when we measure things over the ocean. When you're over land, though, things get kind of tricky. Depends on the, it's very dependent on the emissivity, and it doesn't have as much variability. But something very strange happens in between the emissivity of 0.9 and 1. It, it actually reverses. So, for instance, if you, took a, if you had an instrument, which we had with SSMI, that had a 19 and a 22 gigahertz channel, like called a split window, and you took the difference, okay, what you would find is that difference between the 19 and 22 would either go positive or negative, depending on whether the emissivity is greater or less than 0.95, okay? It turns out, if you just plotted that, that difference, which I'll show next, and you did it over the whole globe, the only places I ever found an emissivity greater than 0.95 was over deserts. It's a customary thing to think that the highest emissivity is measured over vegetation and forests. It's not true because of the roughness associated with leaves and, 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 and the, the actual depolarization that occurs reduces the emissivity. So the only place you're going to really see emissivity is greater than 0.95 is when you have relatively smooth homogeneous surfaces. And I was kind of amazed to see that at first, and then I realized what it was. I'll show that as well. Okay, now these are, this is a very simplified diagram of the emissivity for different surfaces. And this is, this is after taking many, many kinds of measurements from aircraft, from the ground. It roughly looks like this. And uh, we have the highest emissivity for vegetation, new ice, and melting snow, okay? The lowest emissivity, obviously, is water and wet soil, and as well as snow, multi-year ice, and even and dry snow. But you notice the slope is different. Here we have a positive slope. And here we have a negative slope. And, the, and that's very important if you're developing any procedures to be able to discriminate between different surfaces, which we use pretty effectively, actually. Um, some of the things I kind of discovered and is, is this parameter called refrozen snow. And I'm going to talk a lot about that. People were aware of multi-year ice from first-year ice and new ice that there was a, a definite change because of the scattering properties of ice, which causes <clears throat> the emissivity to decrease and change because of the, the air bubbles that are formed within the ice. But this thing about refrozen snow is very interesting, and that has to do with the fact that as the snow crystals metamorphose and get larger, we start seeing a much larger drop, and in some cases, it actually, it actually causes a reversal, which I'll explain. So um, you, can, you can use this as a general guide, but uh, this is some actual measurements that were made uh, using a ground-based radiometer of different types of snow cover, and this is a vegetation. This is water. This is open water. What you notice is, in general, the, with, with snow, 
the emissivity increases as the frequency um, as the frequency decreases, or vice versa, the emissivity decreases as the frequency increases. And you can see here the kind of characteristic you normally get for snow. There are only one example in this whole data set that was generated that shows the inverse operation. And that's right here for, for what he called, um, this was Matzler, Christian Matzler, called this category of surface type number 17. It's called bottom crust. I don't know exactly what that means. It has to do with ice forming on the bottom of the snow, but it's, it's, the point is that if you notice, there's a reversal. This is the, um, this is the 35 gigahertz, and there's, the, and there's the 90, and it reverses. You notice instead of the 90 being less, it actually is larger. And uh, from this, you would gather maybe it's just one anomalous situation. But when you use satellite data, you find this happens a lot more often. And so I, I, I really wanted to spend a lot of time to, to study that. OK, I'll go back to this. But here's, here's the most simplest thing you can do with a microwave radiometer to look for surface wetness. And that's done here for using the polarization difference at 19 gigahertz. And uh, you could see all the areas around uh, Illinois and, and, the, and, and, and all the other areas correlate very well with the amount of rainfall. This is a monthly average. And uh, this, this, is, this is like duck soup because it's very easy to generate these images. You can use polarization difference. You can use frequency difference. But the main thing is it's highly correlated with the rainfall amount just by using the, uh, the polarization difference. And uh, this happened to be flooded land, which of course gives you the, the largest polarization. Okay, now the, the thing that I went, I really enjoyed looking at, and it, it taught me an awful lot, was deserts. This is an infrared image. Actually, it uses the MODIS 8.4, whoops, let me get it again, the 8.4 to, um, uh, to 8.7 micron um, band to generate an emissivity map. And uh, I happened to be at a meeting, uh, basically around 2008, and I was, t was talking about the microwave measurements over the desert. And I met Tom Schmuggy, and he said, why don't you, you know, it's funny, we get a similar feature when we use the infrared. It, it, what I was talking about is these in unusual high, in this case, uh, high emissivities that they were getting for uh, in areas like this and around here, and uh, you can see them all, and very low emissivities here, and they didn't know what it was, but they, they were very, it was interesting to see the variability in the emissivity that they were, they were picking up over the desert. Well, I was doing the work in the microwave, and I already studied these areas here and concluded that this was due to limestone, and this was due to quartz. Um, and I was, so I was very happy to be able to see the kind of signals that they were also getting in the, um, in the infrared. See, this is the microwave image I worked on, and this is what I was briefing on at the meeting. I was picking up these uh, very, very high emissivities for, um, for quartz, okay, and very low emissivities for limestone. And um, if you take a look at some measurements of emissivity that were done, oh, this is actually calculations. Calculated emissivity as a function of the dielectric constant, okay. What you find is the the lowest emissivity occurs for limestone, and the highest emissivity occurs for quartz. This is for three different viewing angles. This is nada, this is, uh, and this is polarization vertical. And this is, so you can actually determine something about the surfaces just by looking at the emissivity, and that's basically what the infrared was seeing as well. The only difference is that in the microwave, quartz has the lowest emissivity, and I'm sorry, the highest emissivity, whereas limestone has the lowest emissivity. It's completely opposite in the infrared, complete opposite. 
And I understand it has something to do with the, uh, the physics of the crystal, crystal surface, crystal of the uh, surfaces. So, um, and by the way, this happens to be a, a, a map that people have produced. This is done by the, um, the oil industry, actually. And they uh, were interested, I guess, I don't know why, but they were interested in knowing where the limestone deposits were. And they line up perfectly, you know, with where the microwave shows, shows the emissivity to be what it is. So here we have quartz having the very, very high emissivity. And this is a very low, very high brightness temperature. And the limestone being complete opposite. So one thing I mentioned before is if you take a look at the difference between the 19 and 22 gigahertz channel, the only place that number that those that difference is going to be high, more than three degrees, this is have very high emissivity. So I took the difference, and lo and behold, all those areas, we still don't know what these areas are, but we sure know this one. This is quartz. And the lowest ones are for limestone. So just taking the difference between the 19 and 22 gives you confirmation that you're looking at very, very high emissivity surfaces. If anybody is doing any kind of calibration, this is a perfect target for your high emissivity surface, much better than anything you can find anywhere else. Um, and these are also areas. Now, if you just take a look at the brightness temperature itself, you're getting the same features in the brightness temperature. Don't forget, these are not correlated at all. This is taking a difference, and this you're looking at the absolute value. So the, um, the highest value corresponds to the largest, largest difference here. And uh, I think that this was a, a nice demonstration. You're not picking anything over the forest in the areas and you know, in Africa at all, because the emissivity, even though it's all forested, is much lower than it would be for some of these surfaces in here. So that is that. Let's go on. Okay, now this is another thing I've, you can discover over deserts. And <clears throat> this discovery actually occurred uh, from people, uh, Prejou, I forgot how to say her name, Prejent or Prejou. She discovered that uh, there was a diurnal variation over the deserts, uh, particularly when you take the difference between, you can't see this, but this is the 19 and the 37 gigahertz channel right there. There it is. And what happens is if you take the measurements and look at them in the, in the morning, okay, then the 19 is higher than the 37, and you get a nice positive difference. If you do it later on in the day, this is 9.30, it reverses. And that's because of the penetration of the microwave in deserts. The 19 gigahertz penetrates, if for this is SSMI, penetrates the most. And so you can see it from this plot that was done independently. This is just a, uh, an example of some surface observations. And if you take a look at the, uh, the, the surface temperature, of course, it has a very wide range because of the diurnal variation. But if you go down below the surface, this is three tenths of a meter, there's no, almost no change. So you can think of this, this, these two differences between this variation and this variation as the difference between the two channels, the 19 versus the 37. 19 gigahertz is almost looking at something which doesn't change. 37 looks at the surface, which does change. So when you take the difference, you, you see these differences at these two different times. Now, if you try the same thing at a higher frequency, this is where the real surprise comes. If instead of looking at 19 and 37, you look at 37 and 85, you would think the same thing would be true because the 85 is, is now at a higher frequency, doesn't penetrate as deep. And so you would think that uh, you would see a diurnal variation relative to the 37, but in fact you don't. They look identical. And the only reason for that that I discovered is because of a thing called scattering. Because of scattering due to sand, the 85 gigahertz is always less than the 37. 
because the 85 scatters more. So you're going to get a positive difference. Even though the 37 may change a little bit, it's not going to make any difference in taking this difference. So it kind of makes you realize that sand is a complex surface because not only does it emit, it also scatters. The previous slide of the difference between the 19 and the 37 was an emission signal. But when you take a look at the 3785, you're now getting to see scattering effects as well because of the 85 scattering by the sand grains, causing its temperature to drop below the 37, independent of what time of day you're looking. And so uh, that, that kind of is interesting because uh, I don't know if we ever really expected that until we actually saw the data. Now, here is something that's even more interesting. Looking again over the deserts, if you look at the um, if you look at precipitation over deserts, it's very hard to determine. To a lot of reasons, but the main one, at least in the microwave, is because if you just had M through A or SSMI, what would happen is you would pick up if by taking the this is like a scattering index, the difference between the 23 and 89, it would it would show features due to precipitation. This happens to be the infrared map uh, image of, from the Mediasat IR. It shows where the precipitation would be expected. Well, in addition to the precipitation you get by taking this difference, you also see all these other uh, noisy-like signals that have nothing to do with precipitation. And it's because of the scattering that I mentioned before at 89 gigahertz which causes the difference to, in, to, to be large in places where, the, where there's volume scattering going on inside the material. And how do you get rid of that? I mean, it, it, it's very, very complicated. But if you take a look at M through B, the difference between the 89, now both of these channels pick up scattering, okay, as opposed to the 23 and the 89. Now the main thing you see is the precipitation. You don't see the scattering from the, um, from the surface, from the sand grains. And the reason that that comes about is because and these are just two, two uh, spectral measurements. One was done at, uh, at this position here, and one was done for the precip. And you can see what happens is that the, sc the sand does scatter, causing the brightness temperature to drop, but then it kind of saturates. And when you get to higher frequencies, whereas precipitation, because the drops are so much smaller, the grains, the ice crystals that scatter, you get a continuous drop as you go in frequency. And that's why the AMSU B, okay, which uses the difference between 89 and, uh, and 150, only picks up the precip. Whereas if you use the, uh, the SSMI, which only went up to 89, you wouldn't be able to separate the two, which is why we're seeing these spurious kinds of signals. So scattering seems to saturate in the case of things like sand, and I'll show you also for certain types of snow. And we believe, I believe that's due to the fact that the grain sizes are so large that you reach a point, it's like called the geometric optics limit, where you start to see similar amounts of scattering at both frequencies. Okay, the next, uh, this is a summary of, uh, of what I, I was explaining. First, there's the emission signal over, over uh, deserts, okay, which shows that quartz has the highest emissivity and the, the opposite response in the infrared, okay, whereas limestone has the lowest emissivity and the highest emissivity in the inf infrared. <coughs> The next thing had to do with penetration depth. At low frequencies, the 19 gigahertz doesn't show much variation because it's sensing the temperature below the, deep inside the, uh, the sand. <coughs> and that the, um, the, relative to the 37, that is. Now, the scattering signals are the ones I found more interesting because they show that uh, <coughs> two things. First, that precip precipitation and snow cover is larger for deserts, okay? If you take a look at the scattering effects of precip and snow compared to deserts, it's much smaller than deserts. 
And the reason being that if you, it, the density of the desert sand is such that the albedo, okay, is less than it would be for, say, diffuse scatters that you would find for precip and even for snow. And that's, that, that's a way of explaining the difference in the scattering intensity of precip and snow compared to deserts. The other thing is the saturation effect, which occurs when the frequency gets higher and higher. And that only occurs when you have dense media, because the, the, um, the, in the case of precipitation, almost always the, the 150 gigahertz is lower than an 89, where in the case of things that are solid, and, and that includes snow as well, uh, you won't see that. It'll basically, uh, you would basically see the same signal between 89 and 150. Okay, now um, here is the example of metamorphic changes in snow cover. <clears throat> Here's an, a, a case study I did uh, in, in December, November, December <clears throat> of 2001, <clears throat> where you're looking, this, this, this bottom set of pictures is actual snow cover derived using the SSMI snow cover algorithm. Okay, it basically looks at the difference between the, um, the, the, the low frequency and the, high, and the high frequency, and these are your scattering signals, okay? And if you, in the case of the AMSU, we, we use the 23 and the 89. Okay, and the SSMI it would be the 30, I think the 19 and the, or the 22 and the 89. You can see this increase in snow, snow area as time goes on. This is each day. And here it is, it reaches a steady state. But if you take a look at the 89 and the 150 gigahertz channels on AMSU, you can see the growth. And this is for values greater than, I think, 5 degrees. I only show those values. <clears throat> you see the growth of this area until you get to this time when then it starts to even diminish. And the reason for that diminishing has to do with the changes in grain size of the snow as the snow ages. So instead of seeing this thing look constant, when you look at the 89 and 150, it starts to, it starts to drop. And we've seen this from, a, I've seen this from a lot of case studies. If you ever look at snow and you look at uh, after a few days even, you'll not start noticing the 89 and 150 starting to difference starting to drop. And <clears throat> the only simple explanation for that is the changes in grain size growth. And this is a simulation that shows that if you take the difference between the 89 and 150, the small grains, you see a po nice positive difference. And then as the grains get larger and larger, it starts to drop. Whereas if you take a look at the lower frequencies, it just keeps increasing. So it's like it gives you a way of detecting changes in the metamorphic signal due to snow, which is very interesting because uh, sometimes you want to know these things um, in terms of the snow stratigraphy and things like that. But here's something even more interesting. When you start looking at the spectrum itself in certain places, instead of seeing a, 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 a this, this happened to be, I picked areas over the U.S., Canada, actually, Greenland, and in former Soviet Union. You see what is a very uh, remarkable change in the, in, in the spectral characteristics. Like, this is a, probably like a more normal characteristic for snow. You see it here, and you see it, and you see it, uh, you see it drop here. But every once in a while, what happens is it, it starts to reverse, particularly when you get to higher frequencies. Um, you see it here. The most unusual example of that is over Greenland, where it looks like a, an ocean surface. And this is in February, southern Greenland. Well, when you see something like that, you think there's something wrong with your instrument. In the middle of winter on a snow-covered surface, the brightness temperature going from 20 to 89 gigahertz increases just like it would if you, had, if you had melting water. And yet this is in the middle of winter. And it took a while to try to figure out the physics involved in that. 
And it has a lot to do with the fact that, at least in that portion of Greenland, southern Greenland, you get melting and refreezing, forming ice layers in the snowpack. What happens when you have ice and snow is the high frequency can't penetrate. So the high frequency, instead of going through a deep layer of snow, goes through a shallow layer. So it doesn't have as much scattering as the lower frequency. And that, whoops. And that's what uh, and that's what caused that that drop. At least that's how I surmise it. And I have another example here, where I took those same I took cross sections and I show. In, in fact, this is in Canada. Okay, this is the normal kind of character. This is a cross section through parts of Canada where the uh, the let's see. Uh, yeah, here, this is the normal spectrum where the lower, the higher frequency is lower than the other one, and it, it goes. But then you notice this area where it's reversal, and that's shown by the reversal is, is indicated by this here. I happen to pick a point right here, and there, here's another example in Russia, and this is the most dramatic one in Greenland where this whole region here shows a complete reversal, where the, uh, the, the, the low frequency has a lower emissivity than the high frequency. And I, you call that an inverted spectrum. Okay, now let's see. So here's the, here's the point. We actually have three classes of snow. We have new snow, which has the normal kind of spectrum where the brightness temperature drops with frequency. You have aged snow where the grains start growing and in fact uh, what happens then is it drops but then it starts to saturate just like it did in deserts. Anytime you have a medium where the particles get larger and larger, no longer do you see any real changes as you increase the frequency. You're reaching what they call the geometric optics limit. And then there's a thing called stratified snow, where you have snow and ice layers. And that causes a very change, big change in the spectrum. So you have three classes. The one that's most common is the new and the aged snow. The stratified snow you can also pick up. But what, what it amounts to is, um, just like when people talk about sea ice, they talk about three types of sea ice first year CI, second year, multi-year. We have a similar situation here in case of snow. <clears throat> and I believe it's possible to develop algorithms like they do for sea ice <clears throat> to identify these three different classes. Let's see. Oh, yeah, well, here's, here's the um, sum summary, basically, of um, the emissivity or the brightness temperature characteristics. <clears throat> As long as you stay below 85 gigahertz, things look pretty normal. You don't get saturation effects. You don't see this inversion. And the algorithms we developed based on SSMI just use this kind of characteristic. But when you get to higher frequencies is where you get interesting effects that you can use. Okay. Uh, this is a, uh, just a summary of what we were able to do with SSMI <coughs> in generating global products. Now I want to turn to, how much time do I have? Did I, did I run out of time? No? Here, here is the second subject. Five minutes. Five minutes out of that. All right, well, this is the thing that, I, let, me, let me go fast. This is the thing that we really, uh, really sold microwave. We took the SCAMS instrument and we saw this very interesting feature for, for a hurricane where we picked up the warm core, whereas the infrared saw no core. <laughs> it basically saw what the, what the, uh, the window channel picked up. And so you can, you can see the, the, the um, importance of the microwave for picking up the um, hurricane um, warm core feature, which is completely blinded by the clouds in the infrared. And so, um, the other thing I want to, oh, by the way, this is in case you haven't seen this, this is, this is MSU. That's, when it, that's at the Smithsonian. It's, you can actually see that there. I don't, I don't know if it's still there. <clears throat> but uh, this is what Vinikoff and I worked on, which was the measurement of the, of the climate changes using MSU. 
it's pretty amazing because this, this trend and all of these anomalies that you see due to penetia, tuba, and the rubber were also picked up from surface-based observations, almost exactly the same. It's pretty, pretty amazing to see. And uh, I, <clears throat> I was very lucky to work on this because this is not something I expected. Nobody expected MSU to be able to do this. It was never designed for this. But putting all the MSUs together and properly calibrating them, then analyzing the, the signal, you're able to pick up not only the, uh, the, the trend, but the anomalies. So I just want to conclude with that. And um, I don't think, I, and there's, of course, there's AMSU, which even does a better job with Hurricane. So anyway, I, I can take some questions now. And uh, <clears throat> I just have to stop at this point. Yes, James. Sure. Uh, first of all, the DK versus total power. So, which one do we have for the space based? Are they all DK? total power? They're all total power. They're all total power. So, because they are rotating and look at a calibration sources. You can you can calibrate so quickly that you can accommodate the the deficiency that you get with total power is because, you know, things vary more, right? But because you can calibrate so quickly, you can remove that effect. And they felt that it's worth to build total power so that they can increase, they can uh, decrease the noise, the NE delta T, by a factor of two. So the DK switch is basically an electronic switch? Yes, it's all it is. All right, okay. All it is. Okay. The, oh, somebody. Uh, uh, my question is: uh, Compare uh, space uh, space ball instrument and uh, surface instrument. Yeah. Which one will be more accurate? Which one will be more accurate? Yes. Probably the space. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. My my second question is: the what's limiting the size of your box? Is a the size of the what? Possible to miniaturize. Oh. I would love to talk about that. There's a new technology out, first of all. So we can put on some new... You can build, you can build a radiometer the size of a dime. The only thing that you can't build is the antenna. If you put all those elements together and put them in a, in, into an array, you can make as big an antenna as you want. You see, I mean, that's, that's what, what it comes down to. You know, the radiometer is the small part. It's the antenna that's the problem. So you build a phase array. They call it a synthetic aperture. By putting these elements every place, you could build a huge, huge antenna. And uh, it's, it's very, very uh, sparse. I mean, it's not a solid surface, you know? You do it electronically. And uh, you could probably build a geostationary microwave now. You couldn't do it before. Yeah. I have uh, two questions. First is why you stop at the uh, 20 gigahertz? Um, why? I can't. Yeah, I try to explain that. The devices that make this radiometer work is that little unit called an LNB, which does all the magic. It does the mixing. It does. They only build those at three bands. If I if if I contacted the um, the manufacturer. And I said, I want a different frequency. They probably could make it for me. I cost a lot. I only pay 10 20 $30. So I stop. Yeah. Besides, they're interesting bands. So basically, this is what you can find in the market. Exactly. I can't build those. OK, the second question is, how long you, uh, it takes for you to put all this stuff together? Oh, 10 years. I, I spent. I, I started doing this when I retired. I, I, I didn't stop. You see, I, I, I basically I love making building things and I like experimenting. And I never wanted to go this far, but uh, it turned out that I had no choice. So I, I, I had to build one like this. And once I did it, I was amazed. I said, God, no wonder these things work. You know, I, I mean, uh, these, these Dicky radiometers are fantastic. And you got to remember, he built them with vacuum tubes. He didn't have transistors. So what, what, what is the most challenging part for you to build this stuff? Oh, the most challenging? 
for you? Um, you know, like I say, the, mo I, the detector. I guess it's the detector. See, I started building a detector simple device, one element. And I found out if I put my finger on the element, I get a different number. It, it changed with the temperature of my... Yeah. So I needed to build what they call a balanced detector. It's made up of two elements in one package. So they both measure the same temperature and you take the difference. It's called a balanced detector. And that, that is very stable, very, very stable. So um, yeah, this thing run, runs days and days like this. The only thing that changes now is the battery gets lower. So to change it, oops, oh, that's my target. But I, 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 don't, I don't use a battery when I work at home. I use a power supply. But they're, they're a lot of fun to make. And uh, the thing about calibrating this channel is hard because this is affected by water vapor. And the only way to get rid of the water vapor effect is to do what they call tipping curve. Anybody know about tipping curve? What you do is you go ahead and you look up in the air, sky like this and you keep measuring at different angles. And when you do that, you're able to take out the water vapor effect. So I, I, yeah, it's fun. The shape of the antenna, your feed horn. Yeah. You, I noticed the rectangular often, why not circular? In, oh, well. In, in what, yeah, is this a V or H? Yeah, this is a very inefficient feed horn. It, it, it doesn't have much gain. It, you know, they talk about feed horn gain. But it's the simplest one to make. And the thing is that the polarization is in this direction, right here, okay? Um, usually people make circular and, they, and, and it's independent of the orientation of polarization. I, 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 have no, I have an easier time building one like this than a circular one. Oh, okay, okay, thanks. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, uh, yeah, I'm happy you're able to hear all this. And uh, like I say, I, I think the thing that's interesting is you take these things out in the field and you do measurements, you can do some very interesting things. <clears throat> I wanted to use it to measure soil moisture, but I never really got to do that. See, my problem is I don't have truth information. <laughs> I need to go ahead and get some truth. I, somebody told me I can get some of that information on, on the internet. That's one more question. Would it be easy to turn it into a radar? Uh, radar? No. Well, you know, there, there's no, there's no uh, transmitted signal. This is all. Could you put a transmitted signal? Yeah, I could make a radar too. I was actually thinking. <laughs> I was thinking of making a radar. I know. I know. That's another subject. That's next year. Yeah, next, we'll back year. next year. <laughs> well, good. I'm happy you enjoyed. I, I didn't know. You know, I gave a talk like this. This is funny. About six, three or four months ago, to a group of uh, radio amateurs, you know, yeah, radio amateurs, you know, microwave type. And I was explaining this stuff first. And they completely conf confused. I had no idea. But when I got to talk about this, they opened up their eyes, you know, and then they realized that. But I, I, I don't know. I, uh, it, it's a multidisciplinary thing. You know, you want to you wanna work with equipment and instruments, and you also want to understand the data. I went the other way. Yeah. Do you have progressed age Yeah, now, that's the thing. And I, I do want to mention this. There's, the, the problem at, the, at free, lower frequencies, of course, is interference, right? Everybody knows about interference. And, well, with these new, new technology, it's called, it's a software design radio, I think it's called software. Design. What they do is they do all of the electronics and software. I, 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 and so you can build very, very precise filters in software rather than hardware. And you can mitigate all kinds of interference. If you're going to build an L-band radiometer, that's the way you have to build it because the interference would be unbelievable. So what they do is they take an antenna like this, okay, and then instead of going through all these different boxes that I have in here, they try to go almost immediately into a computer. And what they do is they digitize the signal that comes out 
so it can be met, can be operated on in a computer. And then they do all their stuff with the software. The big thing is you've got to use an A to D converter to go from analog to digital. And now they can make very fast A to D converters, particularly in the L band region. In fact, all the, uh, all the radios, all the technology, military uses it. It's called software design radio. And so uh, you can finally build things at the, um, at the lower frequency, which I haven't done. I haven't done it. So there is a way to obtain soil moisture information for each agricultural field? Oh, for, no question. Yeah, yeah, the, the, there is no question that you can now build L-band radiometers. And the, uh, in fact, they're using them. Uh, there's a fellow who I know is working on that right now. And um, yeah, you can build these big arrays, you know, and yeah, you can do a lot at lower frequencies. Um, I'd love to play with that. I tried. It's, it's just that you really have to be very good in software. Very good. You, it's all the written C code, you know, and things like that. But uh, you, you have to develop your own specialized program for that. OK. Okay, yeah, it's Rand Powell, and thanks to speaker again.